Sri Lanka, a nation blessed with over 1 million hectares of arable land. Now, if you take from a Sri Lankan perspective, agriculture has been a key part of our economy and our social systems. We were an agriculture based economy. In fact, we boast about being the storage of grain of the East in the ancient times. However, over a time period, many facets of this has indeed gone down. And one of the recent blows to our agriculture sector has been the ban on fertilizers. What exactly went on there? Was that the right move? For many of you who want to know about this and need to get to the bottom of it, what you require is an expert opinion. And that's exactly what we are going to be delivering to you today here in Beesnomics. And joining me for this discussion is Professor Buddhi Marambe from the University of Peradeniya, joining us all the way from Kandy. Professor, thank you very much for joining us today. It's a long journey, so let's make the next 45 minutes fully worth the time of the viewers of Sri Lanka. Sure, Tarangu. Thank you very much for inviting me. Professor, let's talk about uh, this system and what exactly happened. But before that, from a layman's perspective and viewpoint, what exactly is the difference between organic and artificial fertilizer? Tell us about that. Okay, that's a very good question to start. But before I go ahead, let me give a, do a small correction to what you said at the very beginning. When you said it's just more than 1 million hectares, I mean, we do cultivate paddy in two seasons and the total extent is 1.3 million hectares 1. for 3. paddy only. Paddy only. Paddy only. Usually what we say, uh, um, we say is that uh, for Maha season, we cultivate about 800,000 right. hectares and for Yala season, we plan to cultivate about 500,000 hectares. And paddy alone. Paddy alone. Right. So that's how we can get the total cultivated extent for a given year. Right. But usually, though we do that kind of assumption because of certain reasons, people may not cultivate 1.3 million hectares for paddy alone Understood. in a given context. Right. But let me come back to your question. That's the most interesting part because people have to understand what it actually means. Let me give a short preamble for this uh, Tharingu because I think that's the way to start. When we do agriculture, say that we are doing crop agriculture, we do it to get an economically important harvest. Now that means either we remove the leaves, for example, that's a vegetative part, or we remove the grains, that's a reproductive part. Whatever we remove from the system, lots of nutrients will move out of that agriculture system for our consumption. That means when you do continuous cultivation, Tarindu, you are removing nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, and several other nutrients from the soil. So if at all, if you are not going to replenish that, then the crops that we grow will never give us the anticipated yield. That is why these nutrient supplements have become extremely important. And the source that we used to provide this nutrient externally are called or is called fertilizer. So that's the first thing about fertilizer. Now comes to your, uh, let me come to your question called organic and synthetic. Some people call it synthetic, egonic. Yeah. Synthetic is the and best also, way. And they say urea, there are various, I think those are different Vera, those are, those are You are the expert, <laughs> demystify it for us. Yeah, okay. Let me, let me take organic fertilizer first. Organic fertilizers are actually derived from plants and animals. They can be plant parts, animal parts, waste or, or any other material that is derived from plants and animals as I told you at the beginning. Simple as that. When you say synthetic, Though the original source may be natural, but there has been a manufacturing process. Did you get what I mean? Yes. That's the basic difference between organic and inorganic. But there are certain other differences also. Let me tell you. When you look at the synthetic fertilizers, I'm not using inorganic fertilizer term right now. Synthetic fertilizers, they are basically rich in one particular nutrient or two or three nutrients. Usually for plants, uh, Tarindu, they require about 18 to 19 nutrients. There are macronutrients as well as micronutrients. Let me not give you a plant nutrition lecture at this stage, but that is just to understand understand that there is a mixture of nutrients that are required, but the synthetic fertilizers will give one or two, three maybe maximum with a, with a given, given product. Take urea, this is what you told a little while ago, urea contained 46 percent of nitrogen, weight by weight. So when you use urea, the overall objective is to provide the nitrogen nutrition to the system. But when you come to organic fertilizers, there is always a mixture. But the difference once again is that though there is a mixture of nutrients, 
the quantity or the percentage that is there is very, very low. Now, urea, 46 percent nitrogen. If you take organic fertilizer, maybe maximum 1 to 1.5 percent of nitrogen. Do you get what I mean? That is where the problem is. And one other difference Let is that. Let me just interject yeah. a little bit there. This also probably means to get the same level of nitrogen, we have to spend 50 times more yes. on organic. You are quite right, 46 times for example to be precise. But then still there is some other problem. I mean you, you put it very nicely and I, I was coming to that, uh, that uh, difference between inorganic and organic or, or synthetic and organic fertilizers. In synthetic fertilizers, the release of nutrients is always very rapid. That is a rapid release. But when you come to organic fertilizer, there is always slow release. So, these two things go on different directions. It is like you and me for example. In our case, I mean our parents fed us at the correct level of nutrients at the correct time and that is why we are here today. And we take three meals usually. I hope you also take three meals, right? But in between, I've been trying to cut down on dinner, but <laughs> been failing at that exactly. miserably. Right. But then, see, I mean, we also take bites in between. Yeah. So it is something like that. When you when you add fertilizer, snacks, snacks, we call it snacks or bite snacks. whatever, right? And when you add uh, synthetic fertilizer, the nutrient release is rapid. When you add organic fertilizer, the nutrient release is slow, and the mixture is the one that is best suited for a system to the best e to the example that I took a little while ago looking at us. Professor, now let us uh, talk about the banning of it. Well, mm -hmm. That has been heavily debated. Farmers are up in arms against it metaphorically. Yeah. Uh, our farmers are extremely peaceful individuals, but they are mm -hmm. at various cities. This is not only in one city. Mm. They are at various cities protesting and demanding uh, that fertilizer be made available to them. Was it the right move or should it have been phased out in a more fathomable, feasible manner? So, you are trying to compare two scenarios here, Tarindo. One is it is a quick decision, the urgent matter, taking it as a very urgent matter and banning it once for all overnight. And then you are talking about phasing out program. To achieve what, Tarindo? That is where the question is. What are we trying to achieve? in all these cases. Tarindu, we are a developing country and we as you quite correctly said in your introductory part that we had a long history of agriculture in this country and the agriculture has been evolving as well. Professor, I am sure you remember your school days when we used to be taught this in school. I studied in Singhala medium and when they used to say that we were the Peradika Danya Agare. Granary of the East. That's granary of the say. East. Yeah. How proud we felt. Exactly. So, but let us not live in that past. We have to be proud about the past. Agriculture learn and then move learn on. Learn and move on. Agriculture has evolved. And after those ancient kingdoms, I mean, we went through a colonial ruling system. In 1505, Portuguese invaded Sri Lanka. In 1658, Dutch invaded Sri Lanka. In 1796, British invaded Sri Lanka and conquered Sri Lanka in 1815 fully. Now, all these invasions changed our economic pattern actually. Our peasant agriculture system was changed to a more plantation type agriculture because that is what their interest is and was naturally, right. So, if you, I mean, because of those things, the practices that we had, although we were proud to say hey, we had a very good traditional technological system, but then everything has changed thereafter. So, let us start with 1940 for example, after going through all those changes, if you try to compare the paddy production between 1940 and 2020, in this 18 year gap, there is an interesting comparison. In this eight, throughout these 8 years? This 8 years, this 8 years. In, in 1940, we had only 6 million population and we have imported 60 percent of the rice requirement to feed that 6 million population. We did have, we did not have fertilizer, ag we did not spoke of agrochemicals, there was no records at all. And we used traditional technology, traditional varieties which you are proud of. 80 years later in 2020, we have 21.8 million population and we produce more rice than we require. And we have used lot of new technologies. 98 percent of the cultivated extent that we have for rice right now is cultivated to new high yielding varieties. 
all those traditional varieties occupy less than 1% actually. If you Steps look at in it. the right direction indeed. Uh, indeed, because we had to move towards it because in 1940s and also in early 1950s, our scientists at that time, especially the breeders like Dr. Hector Viratna and his team, and there were many people to mention which are not going to do it at this stage, they thought of this well before even the world took over by, by the Green Revolution as we call it because we started developing our new varieties, high yielding varieties, because uh, Tarindu, our average yield in 1940s per hectare was merely 0.65 tons. Yes. 0.65 tons per hectare. In 2020, our average yield right now is 4.8 tons per hectare. Wow. That means the yield that increased 7.4 fold. Not a joke. But the cultivated extent has increased only less than two fold. And look at the development that has taken place, thanks to technology, thanks to the breeders. I mean, our breeders, I mean, worked very hard since early 1950s and came up with the famous H4 rice variety in 1958, even before the International Rice Research Institute was established in Philippines, for example. That's how we started working, about, working on it. I'm sure you heard of BG varieties, yes. BW varieties. I mean, I mean, there are enough stories to talk about, but the important point, with the infusion of technology, thanks to the commitment shown by the researchers and the farming community, we have moved up in the ladder in terms of up in the ladder in terms of agricultural production, especially in rice, because that is our major staple. Absolutely. That's why I'm asking, what is the target by doing this? Yes. I mean, all these things are, have have come up to this level thanks to the technology, as I told you. One such technology is providing nutrients in adequate quantities at the correct time of the growth of the plant. Take rice for once again, paddy for example, Tarindu. Paddy plant receives urea as four splits during the period. In a high yielding, in a high yielding scenario, assuming paddy plant will give us in return five tons of paddy per hectare, the nitrogen requirement alone for that plant to give that five tons is 105 kilograms. Now, when we remove five tons, that means we are removing 105 kilograms of nitrogen. And we are cultivating two seasons per year, Tarindu. Now, how are we going to give that thing back to the nature, back to the soil, if at all we want to continue increasing our yield, enhancing productivity? So, my point is that you quite correctly said that if you are going to use organic fertilizer, the amount of organic fertilizer that we require, look at the bulk on one hand, look at the labor requirement on the other hand, more importantly, they will not be in a position to provide the nutrients at the correct amounts at the correct stage of growth. That's my question once again. Why are what, we are, doing what are we trying to achieve? Have they given a justification? No, the I mean, there are, there are a lot of justifications that have come up. If you look at His Excellency, the President, who came on TV on 22nd April, this decision was taken on 27th by the Cabinet of Ministers. But on 22nd April, he was very clear, very strong, saying that the President himself said that he's going to ban the, the, the use of import, uh, sorry, the import of inorganic fertilizer, as he called it, and the pesticides. Fine, I mean, they, they, that was a decision given. But in 27th April, the Cabinet of Ministers came up with another good idea based on a uh, Cabinet paper put forward by His Excellency saying that, okay, to tackle the climate change issues in a sustainable manner, let's look at a green socio-economic pathway. That was the overall concept that was brought in. Under that, there were 20 items. One of one such items is, as you said, the ban to ban the importation and the use of uh, synthetic fertilizer and pesticides. So it, it, it looked like a decision that has been taken within one, one week period. Maybe there were plans earlier, but this is not the right time and it is not the correct decision. That is the important part. A uh, correct decision has to be taken at the right time not only for agriculture, if you want to develop any sector, any economic sector in this country, you have to take that path. And this is one of the worst decisions that have been taken since independence, as I say it. Why? Why I'm saying that? I'm not worried about the private sector companies who bring in fertilizer and so on. That is not the case. We are looking at the food security of our nation, Tarindu. Which has not been a problem for a long time. Long time, especially for paddy especially for paddy. No matter what, there is food to eat. Exactly. That has to be. Food security is national security. You should never yes. forget that. If you try to, if you try to uh, with play it. with it and mess with it, then we are all in trouble. We have to keep that in mind and we have to make sure there's long-term plans to sustain the food security. That's the important part. 
But this decision that has taken Tharindu, I mean, with all the From research evidence, perspective. scientific perspective, with all the research evidence that we have, is going to affect our food security. Definitely, is going to reduce the yield of paddy even and tea. We have already experiencing that even right now. Few days ago, I, I, I saw a market report with respect to tea, and the yields have gone down in the month of June dramatically. And I, I, I didn't even expect that to happen, to tell you frankly, Tharudu, because there was always talk going around that we have already imported the required quantities of fertilizer for this season. But it looked like that fertilizer, whatever thing that have been imported, have not reached the practitioner. So the problem is there. Now, can you imagine what will happen in the future? So that's my question once again. What are we trying to achieve? I, I know I cannot put forward that question to you. We are also asking that question from ourselves. Right, but, but I it think gets us thinking and hopefully yeah. it will get the decision makers thinking exactly. as well. Professor, we are going to come back to you soon for more on that. Stay tuned. We will be back after this short break. This is Biznomics. <music> Welcome back to Biznomics, your weekend's most profitable 60 minutes. We are in conversation with Professor Buddhi Marambe regarding the recent decision on fertilizers being used in the agriculture sector, the repercussions of it, the implications and what could be done differently. Professor, now I personally believe that when you are shifting from one type of uh, fertilizer to another, the soil also can't get adjusted overnight. So for an agri system to get adjusted from the inorganic to the organic fertilizers, how much of a time period are we looking at? Okay, let me uh, I mean, respond to that question giving an example out of a long term research that has been done at Batalagod Rice Research and Development Institute. They did work, their soil scientist, Mr. D. N. Sirisena, a well respected soil scientist, and his team did 11 year long research. That means 22 cultivating seasons, Yala and Maha. And they found that right throughout these 11 years of research, when the plots of rice, paddy, is only being treated with organic matter or organic manure when compared to the conventional fertilizer or synthetic fertilizer application the yield average yield in that organic plot has always been in the range of less than 21.5 percent to 31 percent did you get what i mean so when you cultivate using only organic fertilizer the rice yield will reduce the paddy yield will reduce by 21.5 percent to 31 percent this is continuously done continuous data based on scientifically valid experiments carried out for 11 long years Tarindu. We, I mean, what do you need more, for example? What, 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 is, what, what is the better example that I can sub provide you at this stage and the audience to tell that this is not going to work? If at all, our target is to enhance productivity and make sure the contribution of agriculture sector to the national food security is going to be maximum. But if you ask me a question, for example, can we go organic? Yes, we can go organic. No argument at all. Or, I'm not talking about organic farming because organic farming is, 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 is something, I mean, a lot of people tell me not to say it like this, but it's like a religion. Organic farming is a, there's a certification product, uh, process or product and process, and then naturally it goes in a different direction. So leave that part aside. Let the organic farming be promoted in Sri Lanka because it earns a lot of foreign exchange to our country because of the demand that you find overseas. But that doesn't mean the productivity. That doesn't mean the food security. But of course, food security, we also can meet it partly by importing food. So if you have foreign action, we can do that. Which we don't have right now. Right now. But then the real point should be, we have to maximize the contribution of the agriculture sector to food security. So we cannot achieve that if you try to move totally into organic matter application based on all the evidence that is available in Sri Lanka and outside as well. Give me a, give me a little bit of time to bring an example from Bhutan. We have time. You, you know, Tarindu, Bhutan is the first country in the whole world that said that told in public and to the whole world saying that they are going to go organic by 2020. When did they do Last that? Last year. No, they did it in 2014. Sure, they did it in 2014, but they wanted to achieve, as you quite correctly said, last year. But in 2018, they changed course. They went into a reverse gear and said that, okay, there's a problem in our country. 63% of the rice that we eat, we are now importing. 21% of the maize we are importing and 23% of the vegetables we are importing. This is what Bhutan said. They said, okay, no, we are not going to achieve it in 2020. Okay, we, we are shifting our goal to 2035. 
just imagine the situation that we have in the global scenario. Reuters took this message globally in 2014 saying that Bhutan is going to be the first organic country by 2020. In 2018, everything changed. I'm not trying to say to do the same mistakes or the things that Bhutan did, but let's we take that. We them. should learn from those mistakes, and we should let's let's learn what has happened. I mean, it's obvious what has been there. Majority of their land were fallowed because people did not go for cultivation. They may they may grow organic and they may get more 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 money for their product, but they start importing food for their own consumption. Now, what is the guarantee that food and is I going to be organic? I believe fertilizer will be more expensive when it's organic. Exactly. And how do the poor farmers afford it? Sure. I mean, those things are there. The economics will come into picture always. Sri Lanka Agriculture Economics Association came up with a very sound analysis. It went on newspapers also. They said, uh, um, uh, Tarindu, that if at all we are going to go ahead with uh, organic farming, sorry, not organic farming, changing from uh, uh, chemical production system to organic matter, use yeah. of organic matter only, right. we are going to have drastic reduction in yield and it's going to impact the e economy of Sri Lanka negatively, very bad way, in the near future as well. So this is something that we have to be very, very careful when we try to take these type of decisions and implement them. Professor, you asked, why are we doing this? And I've seen so many different uh, professionals who come and sometimes even meet the president, and this is aired on TV as well, where they say, oh, you know what, uh, using these uh, chemical fertilizers is leading to so many kidney <coughs> diseases and so many other health-related problems. So this is a good move that you are being, you are carrying out. But my question, is there a direct relationship between the usage of these artificial or chemical fertilizers and the rampant kidney diseases we see in places like Polon Narua? Tarindu, associations can be there always between two variables. When there are two variables, there can be association. But that does not necessarily mean there is a cause result effect. And I'm using this example that there I'm going to give you. There can be spurious correlation. Exactly. Say. I'm going to give this example to you, which I usually use in my classes. If you get the number of cars imported to Sri Lanka since 1948, the year that we gained independence, into Y axis. And to X axis, the paddy yield increase since 1948, there's a very strong association. That doesn't mean paddy farmers purchase cars. <laughs> I mean, th th that is not the case, Tarindu. Now, I mean, associations can be there always, but provided that you can scientifically explain and give valid reasoning to say that, okay, this is a cost result effect. Now, very recently, today is, to, I mean, when you look at about a month ago, on 14 June, on, a, on, on, on national TV, the chairman of the National Research Council came for a very popular discussion and made a very strong statement. What he said was that after a long-term research that had been concluded very recently, the NRC researchers, the National Research Council researchers have now identified two factors, two causal factors as main reasons for the CKDU. One is that the farming community and people in Rajarat area, especially in Anuradhapur area, does not drink water adequately. Number two, we all know there's always high fluoride content, fluoride content in the groundwater and in soil in Rajarat area. Uh, you have heard of this dental mottling, and so that's because of the fluoride content, right? And that was known for ages, but fortunately, at least now, they have come up with scientific uh, basic scientific results, valid scientific results to say that these are the two causal factors. Now, a similar thing was said in early 1990s, but people did not even care about it because what, who said that were chemists? Who said uh, the similar thing about about the CKDU versus fluoride association or relationship. The CKD was chronic uh, chronic kidney disease. Chronic, chronic kidney disease of uncertain etiology. That's what people say, right? And the the, the it was again, I mean, based on based on map poles and so on. Said that this is the most possible cause. It more than took more than 28 or 30 years right now for us to come back and say, okay, these are the causal factors. Now see what has happened in the society. I mean, myths and fancies, and also ideas that coming out without proper scientific proof have taken the whole society on a right side. Right. I mean, the worst part is when you go and give this message to the person who has been unfortunately affected by CKDU, chronic kidney disease, 
people start believing it, isn't it? Yeah. When they come they're on TV... They're looking for escape, they're looking for something exactly, to blame this no, on. Naturally, naturally, person, if I am affected and a medical officer say that you are a medical officer, you are coming and giving a diagnosis and telling me that this is the cause and effect, I tend to believe it, naturally. Now, look at the level at which the messages have gone into the, into the society. There are two things I always teach my students also. Scientific communication is one thing. Communicating science is the second. Those are two different ball games. You have to be very careful and tactful as well, but get the correct message across to the society, especially in scientific terms. And so people my point need to is believe in science. Be people and, need to and believe in science. And exactly. not just what is just mentioned no, without a no, proper no, evidence. No, not at all. You are quite right. I totally agree with you. The important thing, once again, there is no evidence to the claim that I be made that fertilizers are responsible for CKDU. But there was an issue earlier, uh, Tarinu saying that the heavy metals that are, that usually some people say the fertilizers get contaminated with heavy metals and those heavy metals have caused this problem. But that is also being negated right now at this particular moment. Professor, isn't this a part of a bigger problem like the lack of a proper national policy for agriculture? Firstly, my question is, do we have a, my question is not whether we have a agriculture policy because I'm quite sure we do. But do we have a politically independent agriculture policy? Because unfortunately, we see every five years when the governments change, they, hit, they tend to hit the reset button on so many things. For agriculture, do we have a proper political independent policy? Um, there have been lots of efforts to develop national agriculture policies I mean, for a, for a long period of time. There have been many national agriculture policies, to tell you the truth. Even now, at this very moment that I'm talking to you, Tarindu, of the finalization of the new national agriculture policy that has been prepared. Again, new? New. Uh, new. I must tell you, let me, let me tell you why I'm telling okay. that. A new agriculture policy is now being finalized at Peradeniya by, by group of people right now. Right. Now, the point that you brought in is a national agriculture policy which does not have a political clout or political strings attached. That's the important point you are bringing in. Because it has to continue no matter who exactly. is in power. Now, because of this reason, few years ago in 2019, with the support of the EU, the Department of National Planning under the Ministry of Finance came up with an interesting idea called overarching agriculture policy. Now, when you look at the agriculture sector in this country, Tarindu, there are many, many ministries that get involved in. Fisheries at a separate location, isn't it? We have agriculture right now. Irrigation under separate ministry. Okay, when all the, we have to bring in all these ministry into action to achieve the overall targets of the agriculture sector of this country. So the idea of the Department of National Planning had to have an umbrella policy first called overarching agriculture policy, which will not change. For example, as you correctly said, say for some time, for 10 years, for example, let's have to move in within that umbrella, under that umbrella, and have sectoral policies develop under that umbrella, maybe for food crop sector, maybe for livestock sector, fishery sector, and so on. And that is the effort that's happening right now, for example. That's what I say, new. So don't take it in a wrong context. The ISA no watching agriculture policy, unfortunately, has not gone into the cabinet yet, but the national agriculture policy has been now been done for the food crop and feed crop sector. So we are targeting on those aspects to make sure there is a clear policy guidance and directives are being given to develop those. So irrigation sector will have to come up with a separate sectoral policy under this overarching policy. So this will be one of the way out there in the, because if you look at India for example, India has a national planning commission. They set up the overarching policy and all other sectoral policies come under that. So this is one of the good initiators. I mean, it's good. It's good to copy good things. Yeah, for sure. Isn't it? so? I think we have to follow those type of system. I mean, our system is different. Operational system mechanism is different to India. But there's a good practice that they have done. So we are using that. We have used it, and I'm happy to say that even the present Minister of Agriculture, I mean, has served him in this particular activity on this national agriculture policy, has taken keen initiative to do it and make sure it will go to the cabinet and support countries' agricultural development in the future. Happy to hear there are some steps at least being taken in the right direction, Professor. We are going to come back to you more on that. Stay tuned. We will be back after this short break. This is Biznomi. Welcome back to Biznomics. We are focused today on the fertilizer problem of Sri Lanka. What can be done about it? What should have been done? And we are in conversation with Professor Buddhi Marambe. 
Professor, let's talk about the capacity of Sri Lanka to produce these fertilizers. Like I said, arable land on an average close to about a million hectares, but looks like using the companies that are into organic fertilizer production in Sri Lanka and the, the small farm owners who might produce their own, we can only cover somewhere around 300 to 400,000 hectares. That's our local production capacity. Yeah. What are we doing about the rest? Interesting and a good question as well, very timely. Um, let, let me put it this way. We can produce the required quantities of organic fertilizer, some or other, we can. But then the problem is whether we can provide the required amount of nutrients to the, to the, to the crops that we grow. That is the million dollar question, mm -hmm. not the quantity. One thing I must tell you, Tarin. Professor, and I am a layman at this, yeah. but if the right nutrients don't reach the, the crop, I believe the crop will not survive. No, like us. Like us. That's no why I bought the example. Yeah, that's, that's why I bought the example at the very beginning in Tarindu. Our parents fed us and made sure the correct quantity of nutrients went in at the correct time. I'm repeating what I said earlier also. Yes. Same thing applies for a plant because it's a living matter. It's a living organism. So it requires nutrients at a correct growth stage. No matter how quick or how slow the fertilizer provides nutrients, the plant has a nutrient absorption pattern. Tarindu. You cannot change that unless you do lots of work in terms of breeding and to come up with a new variety. It's a, it's a long term process anyway, just forget about that for the moment. But one thing I'm happy with the current decision is that Tarindu Department of Agriculture, when it came up with its fertilizer recommendations, have always been telling people to apply synthetic fertilizer and organic fertilizer together. This happened in certain cases, in certain cases it is not. But the beauty of this decision right now is that we see people are producing organic fertilizer everywhere. But we have to be very careful about the source. When you bring in municipal solid waste tarindu to build, to, to make compost, and when you try to add it to agricultural land, we have to be very careful tarindu because municipal solid waste can carry a lot of contaminants like heavy metals. So you have to be very careful. You need not ask for trouble. Correct. By doing this, right? But let's say, let's say we are doing it at the correct way. We are, we are producing good quality compost based on the standards set by the Sri Lanka Standard Institute. Let's say that happens. So in that case, I'm still happy people are working towards developing this industry and producing more organic matter. But once again, there's no guarantee. Actually, there cannot be a guarantee. For example, that the organic matter that has been produced or fertilizer that has been produced are giving the required nutrient quantities to the plant. So that is where the so, problem is. So we is. are taking a big risk. Process. We are taking a big risk. Now to avoid that, government, is, government has taken one measure. They have already announced that government is going to import organic based, or in other words, a material which is nitrogen containing high nitrogen, but the base is organic. So they are trying to import that and trying to enrich the organic matter that we have produced. The nitrogen levels being built up to about 5% from 1% quite a quite a huge thing to thing, thing to do even though you increase that nitrogen content in organic matter organic matters have tendency to release nutrients slowly unless other inputs also come in there it's not going to be an easy task but let's hope and pray because the country should develop country sure. should evolve although i say this this not the not a not a good decision at all that has taken the country should evolve so we have to look look positively we but have, then we all have our national interest our national interest, but there in the danger is max the risk that we are going to face is maximum in this system. Yeah. That's my no, point because always. Because the worst case scenario will be in a particular season if the, all the main crop, let's say paddy crop begins to die in so many different areas, yeah. then only we will feel the brunt let, of let, Let's say it's not dying, but, but reducing the paddy crop by 25% is going to affect us. Look at even after having a bumper harvest last year, we are now going to import 100,000 metric tons of rice from India. I'm telling you from India because the variety's name was given in the tender. Right, so it's going to going to be from India. Hundred thousand metric ton, despite the fact we had a bumper harvest last Why, year. What, what did we do with that bumper harvest? That's the point, and that's one important point that we had to look into. We have been telling this for a quite long period of time. Many governments to be blamed because we did not go to a centrally controlled database to understand what is happening in agriculture in this country. I mean, we are good at calculating and telling people this is the harvest that we got. Yeah. But we are not good at all to tell where that harvest is. We are good at calculating but yeah. not at being accountable. Okay, exactly. And no, we, we do not know where it is right now. But when you go to the market, Tarindu, there's no shortage of rice. But there's a price issue in rice. For sure. 
that is where the problem is. So if a bumper harvest came in, rice price cannot go up to this level. And if you think of reduction of rice yield, paddy yield by 25 percent, do you want me to do a calculation and tell uh, what would be the rice the price scenario in the future? Looks quite detrimental. Quite detrimental. Professor, a very important part of this entire economic system of agriculture, the farmers. Are we not being unfair by our farmers by doing this? Because the way I see it, farmers are angry. They feel that they have been just left, you know, hung to dry because no one seems to be caring about the yeah. problems they face. They are overnight expected to spend more on organic fertilizer. These are not millionaires and billionaires, Professor. These yeah. are common, ordinary people of this country, mm. people who have been feeding our country. Are we not being extremely unfair by them in this matter? The simple answer is yes, but there are two sides to every story, as you all know. To be fair by the government, there was an assumption, I don't know why that assumption came up. There's an assumption that the required fertilizer to cultivate crops for this season has already been brought into Sri Lanka. And that's why people, the Consumer Affairs Authority, you see they are raiding shops, they are raiding people's houses and so on to find whether there are fertilizer being stored. And day before yesterday or a few days ago, we saw that uh, uh, the Cabinet Minister of Agriculture and the State Minister of Agriculture are also visiting fertilizer storage houses of, of the private sector companies who have imported fertilizer. So if that fertilizer have not gone into people's hands, and that's where the problem is. That's so how where does it go is the question. Exactly. The where, it is go where has it gone is the question. You are quite right. I, I cannot answer very frankly. I mean, uh, I feel very desperate sometimes as an academic where I cannot answer that question. But when I see when the government cannot answer that question, I mean, there's a big question mark in front of me now as well. So that's one side of the story. The other side of the story is that even farmers did not it did not even assume that fertilizer will not be available for them to at least to purchase and apply. Fertilizer is given free of charge in this system right now. So they, they were so scared, so desperate, and once you give fertilizer or anything free of charge, you, you use it for other, you get used to it and use it for other, other practices as well. When the fertilizer is given for paddy, people may even use it for vegetables, for example. So there can be misuses like that. Uh, with all the people being overusers, I mean, that's a different scenario, Tarindu, but there can be misuses like that. So then the farmers are in trouble in both angles. But the government has taken a decision. They have already announced it. One thing is they are going to pay about 12,500 rupees per hectare for a person if you are going to produce organic fertilizer up to a maximum of two hectares. That is the limit being given. But then that's that not is, going to solve that is, that is per per hectare per farmer up to a maximum of uh, two hectares. Right, and so right. That, that's, a, that's a payment for which time period, uh, Professor, we are looking at? They are, they are not, not told about the time period. The cabinet mm. decision was taken very recently. It may be a one-off payment. Yeah. We never know. It all depends on country's economy. I mean, you cannot go on financial institutions, subsidies continuously like this. That's we have to understand. Yeah, yeah. That we, have, we have to understand that. The second point is that government has already given a pledge if if a farmer after moving into after i mean i mean moving away from total chemical application into a organic matter application agriculture of that system if there's a yield loss they will get compensation okay now so the farmers it look like okay but tarindu don't forget every farmer is also a consumer paddy farmer is a consumer of potato isn't it yeah right you and me are consumers total consumers total on the other hand right but then if the money is given to consumers, we cannot eat money. Very nice way of putting it, Professor. So you have to be very careful in these decisions. Professor, you work with farmers, I believe, much more closely and you've interacted with them. What are their sentiments, Professor? What are they saying? What is their, what is their biggest grievance right now? The biggest grievance, uh, uh, Tarindu, availability of fertilizer. It's not the price that they are worried about. Remember in 2016, 2018, that time, at that time government decided to remove the material subsidy of fertilizer and they give finance to people to purchase fertilizer. Something similar that the government is going to do with respect to organic fertilizer production right now. It's a good move, but the problem at that time was non-availability of fertilizer at the correct time. You saw the end result thereafter. Government has to bring back the original idea of giving giving material subsidies and so on and the whole system collapsed for a certain time period and of course there was a climate change issue we had the i mean worst drought in 40 years in 2016 and 2017 all those were confounding effects but addition was taken at the wrong time 
as I told you earlier. So, also. good decision at the wrong time is still a bad decision. Exactly. So, the, 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 the issue is that people did not predict the future. There was no information available for us to look at that prediction, do that prediction, do that forecasting. That's why I said a little while ago, it is important to have a centrally governed database so that we can look at the future in a more optimistic manner and also do, in, do statistical forecasting with higher probability of achieving things. So this is where how we have to move forward, Tarindo. But then as for farmers, their sentiments right now are they have been let down. They have been let down. That's how that's what they feel. And what you see on TV, their people are shouting slogans, are, are coming from the bottom of their heart. I mean, there may be a political clout. I, I, I'm not saying no. When we see certain certain uh, people who are in the system, there can be, but you but cannot you, can't bring, you cannot generalize, and you cannot bring farmers asking for fertilizer, showing their crop how the crop has retarded in in terms of vegetative growth, for example. You cannot bring in people onto the road front in a situation like this, especially by force. No, because they feel it. And they are not coming because they are getting dollars from NGO. It or anything. is their livelihood. Tarina. It's very sad to see them being accused of that, isn't yeah, it? it? Saying is that they are protesting for money. Yeah, yeah, that's that, that's a very bad thing to do. But then it's their livelihood. Don't forget that. Yeah. It's their life. They are fighting the, for their, their life. Their families have been yeah, dependent on exactly. that. Exactly. Professor, on a final note, for any business that is now caught in this entire storm of transition, let's say an agriculture based business, what is your advice to them? Yeah, we cannot simply wait. It's not a business as usual scenario. We have to understand that. Innovations will have to come always, Tarindo. Despite the risks that are there, we have to move into risk mitigating efforts. That's the important point. And I'm always telling that the Department of Agriculture, for, I will come, come, come to your question, come back to your question. Department of Agriculture has always been recommended to go ahead with good agricultural practices. They started formally adopting that system since 2016. Okay, so it's getting, I mean, it was, I mean, the, the momentum has been there, but then all of a sudden this decision will derail the process. But then still, we cannot wait. I'm inviting all the entrepreneurs in this country, private sector, we have to look for alternatives. But alternatives does not come within a flash. Tarindu, to develop a good variety or cultivar of tea, it takes 25 years. Wow. With all the new technologies, we have cut it and short all the 18, available. Okay. We 18 years. With all the new technologies. Almost that we two have. decades. Yeah. And to build, uh, develop a good rice variety, it takes 12 years. With all new technologies, we have now cut it, sho cut it short for five to six years. Good but with job, risk and so on. on that. So the people, the people are doing that. And thanks to people at Department of Agriculture, Tea Research Institutes, universities, of course, we are being helping to the best possible extent. So if we start working on it right now, because the system has changed, but I sincerely hope while saying so, Tarindu, I'm actually requesting the government to revisit this decision. That's my point. I mean, while saying that, we have to think very hard, think rationally, revisit the system. While, while that is being done, let's also try to move towards actions to mitigate the risk. Revisit the decision, but also based on science. Based on science. Look you at are quite the science. Right. You are quite right. Thank you. So you, you said something that I should have said at that particular point. Look at the science. Go by the scientific principles. Talk science and do science. That will definitely yield expected results. Professor Budhima Arambe, thank you so much for joining us today. You shared a wealth of knowledge. You, we got to the bottom of this problem. You shared all your thoughts and your research expertise on this matter. I sincerely hope that the people who are in the decision-making seats of this country on matters like this will listen to wisdom from individuals like you. Because at the end of the day, we want what's good for the country and we want the damage that can happen to the economy of this country to be minimized and also to make sure that the farmers are not just uh, left high and dry but rather looked after and they are in a good situation and a lifestyle themselves. Thank you so much for joining us and wishing you good luck with your future endeavours. Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. Thank you. And with that, we wrap up today's episode of Businomics. No matter what business you may be in, have a profitable week ahead. I will see you with the next episode. <music>